What if you wanted to go to heaven, but God said? This is a 3D third-person demo featured in official Godot documentation. Let's read the thing. A 255 strings code page with 150 strings physics update function that contains 14 if statements. Yeah. If your project is anything like that, I want you to know, you deserve better. And I am not talking about dividing your physics update into functions. Follow me and I will show you how you can start your project in a way you won't experience bitter regrets in the future. Welcome to God Controller tutorial series. But before we code anything, we'd better answer a question. What even is a player character? Well, player character is a system which controls, simulates and visualizes a character that is controlled not by autonomous script, but by a human that actively presses his inputs. Hmm... If only humanity had some theory on completing such ambitious tasks. Actually, we have. It's called MVC Software Design Pattern. And I want to clarify one thing. I'm not a preacher that persuades you to use some enterprise practices for greater good. You are already using them, and I want you to become aware and bend their reality to your knees. Let me illustrate my point. Godot has an option to use a template for a new script, and one of these templates is a basic controller for a 3D character. You can opt in to use them when creating a script for a character body 3D node. Let's read it. If input, then model. If input, then model. Simulate. But we don't have any graphics yet. Let's add a capsule to our player. Now we can launch our game and control the character. The code didn't change, but the visuals are updating. Why is it? Well, see this win white line? It tells us that capsule is a child not to the character. The term child in this context means that it copies some transformation from the parent. So in the frame update function, there is an invisible instruction. We moved parent. Now move children. If input happens, then change model parameters, then simulate, then visualize. The basic character template already complies with the MVC approach. Now when we understand it, what can we do better? Well, the first thing I want to fix is this strange right order of operations. Let's first cover all possible inputs, solve all possible conflicts there, compress data and pack it into a usable object. Then we give this input object to the model to simulate, and only then we start the visualization process. Right? Model knows nothing about the process of input gathering, and is only interested in the input data. You is only interested in changes in the model fields and knows nothing about the simulation process. So there is no reason to have the code of these different parts to be in one place. And if we don't need them in one place, what are they even doing here? Why aren't they all independent components? Today we are using two input fields and one model field, but it isn't for long we are creating a big game here, so no need to blow the central class, am I right? Create two simple nodes, call them like input and model, and cut this code to there, we don't need it here. This process of crushing your code to smaller pieces is called choosing abstractions, and it is one of the best things you can do with your project. We did an initial cleanup, but let's pause for a second and think of the feature. An encapsulated input package is nice to have, but what our model does with it? Oof, our model is actually still uses the if something then something approach. Let's talk about it. You want to create Mario? You can take your if statements and you are good to go. You want to create Hollow Knight? You probably still can, but it won't be pretty, I promise you. You want to create a Souls-like combat? You are doomed. Combat stance switching, double wielding, shield usage, evasion rolls, heavy attacks, partially charged heavy attacks, poise, comboing running and attacking into a single animation of run attack. Just no. But why? Why is it? Is Godo an engine for Marius and Hollow Knights at best? Are we cursed? N no, you aren't. But we need another round of abstraction choosing. Game characters can do many things, but they have a common feat. They aren't doing many things at once. Most characters have an initial state and a number of other states they can, can transition to in response to some inputs. 
you know what else has this description? State machines. And yes, state machines will probably be a reoccurring theme on this channel, but if you really think of it, what in games is not a state machine? Not in, in an implementation sense, but in a mathematical one. For a fencing game with long clock and animations, probably the whole character is a state machine. In a dynamic movement shooter like Apex Legends, the character is probably a sum of two set state machines, legs and torso, so it can shoot, throw grenades and use abilities, all together with jumping, sliding and wall running independently. But why bother? Well, imagine you have a character that can have 40 states. That's 40 behaviors. Even if you have a perfect binary definable branchings, your physics update function needs to have 6 if statements. But in reality, to define between 40 states, you will probably need about 30 branching operators in one function, in one main per frame update function in your project. But what if I tell you it's easier to have 40 small scripts? Because in the case of script prep state bases, the branches aren't trying to define every of 40 states. Branching only defines if the state is in need of transition at the first place, and that only if it is to define a row to several possible states it can be transitioned to. I hope I saw the idea, now let's implement it. First thing you need is a container for a state machine. The ideal candidate is our already defined model node. Second thing you need is to decide between thin container with smart states and smart container with thin states. Smart container is a container that contains all transitional logic and only delegates the model properties as updating to the states. This experience can be similar to an if galore, but more organized and again only a transition logic there. You can think of using it when you have small amount of highly tight states. The thin controller is the encapsulation class that only routes the input request to the state similar to API gate, and then states themselves are responsible for both transition logic and model update cycle. I will base this tutorial on a thin container approach. Next thing you need to consider is Godot-specific organization questions. First, where are you storing your states? You can just initialize them and then have a link access, or you can literally instantiate them as a child nodes for your container. Remember that some processes in Godot are working only if you have your node inside the tree, like for example timers. Second, do you initialize your states once at the start of your program? or do you do it constantly? For example, if you want to record and restore the past, you can think of destroying and creating new state nodes every time they are transitioning. This way your states can have an ID parameter. I want to restore the past, but I discovered for myself a cool touch using animations to do it deterministically, so I use a console of states that are switching their priority once in a while. Now let's finally create a base state. I came from a background where a number of character abilities is called moveset, so my base state is called move. You can call it whatever you want, state, character state, animation base, ability, everything will work. Base state must contain two methods, one for transition logic and one for updating the model. Again, call them whatever I called mine check relevance and update. It also will contain some variables that all states will have in the future. And I personally added two methods to use on the start of the state work and in the end, because a lot of things can benefit from it. Backtrack a bit to the input package. Godot input system works with actions as with their string names. We can comply with it and use similar system in our model as well. In this context, compressing four input actions into a single vector is okay. But the step of turning jump action into a boolean I would skip and just forward this information as a string. For this, create an array of strings and just show there all the actions you see fit, and then the transition logic will think of what to do with it. To recreate the basic template behavior, we need three states. Idle, running and jumping. Idle one is simple. It updates nothing and only checks if jump action is pressed or if input vector is not zero. Running one gives its priority if jump is pressed or if input vector is zeroed. And the jumping one is more interesting. First, it can utilize the odd enter method to give the player positive vertical velocity at the start. 
then we want to achieve foreign sometimes, so in the update we are modifying that velocity as well. And the transition logic is also different. We simply won't give the priority while player is airborne. Then we check the input vector to decide between idle and run. And to wire this all up, I am using a small operator class that simply routes the inputs. And of course, who writes the right code from the start, so debug a bit. The demo is done, but I still have some questions to my state's behavior. See this transition logic. Isn't an if galore yet, but we have an if per state, and the code is heavily duplicated. Remember, if we had 40 states, this will be 40 ifs in every script, and I didn't create all this to end like this. When you see duplicated code, think of the place you can do this instead to avoid duplicating. This isn't a structure question, but an implementation one, so different elegant solutions can emerge. What I thought of is I saw the order of idle and running logic. We clearly are prioritizing the jump to our movement, and the future states will certainly have this phantom priority. Well, if they have them, why are they phantom in the first place? Why aren't they a field somewhere in our abstraction? Look at the jump state. It has its input action in the Godot sense. If jump button pressed, jump action re registered in the actions array. But why idle and running must be different? Aren't they have their action buttons too? Running action buttons are any of arrows or we are ASD. Idle action is no other inputs pressed at all. What if actions array really contained all actions player issued? Possibly all 40 of them are strings code. Well, then we moved from logical code branching to a data structure. And data structures we can sort. What if we literally had an action priority written somewhere? My transition logic is in my states, but if you use smart container, you'd probably have it there. Create a dictionary that assigns an action string to its priority weight. Then create a custom sort function that sorts strings based on the weight data. Now our states are having two main behaviors. They either ready to change or not. Their readiness is an internal function. For example, jump state isn't ready to change if player isn't touching floor. And if state is ready to change, no questions being asked. It just transitions to the highest priority out there. The running and idle codes now are simple as fuck. And the only price we pay for this beauty is our input gatherer's code having to do some work. Does it have branches? Yes, it does. And it will have an if statements for each new action you add to your game. But look at those if statements. They are completely linear and interchangeable, truly one level of encapsulation. And the code in the branches is harmless, it just appends a value to an array. We completely separated our input logic from our simulation logic, and it turned out both became easier to understand. The states approach crushes your solution into smaller portions, and it's a really liberating thing. When you want to implement a feature, you know the state you want to change or create to achieve this. For example, if you want to give our player the ability to change the play direction in the air, simply modify the update function in jump and recognize input vector. If you want to use a more modern approach to jumping, divide it into two states, jump starts and then fallen. The jump start gives player initial speed and lingers for some time to lock inputs and to let animation flow. Then it transitions to the fallen state, where animation changes and, for example, ability to make plunging attacks appears.